Good morning, everybody. Happy Mondays, unless you're a BBC presenter. And welcome to the News Agenda with me, Fleet Street Fox. And today I'm joined by the Mirror's Deputy Political Editor, Ben Glaze, who's written the paper today. Good morning, Ben. Morning, Susie. I hope you've given your fingers a rest since yesterday. They seem to have done <laughs> all the typing. Um, now, this is the People's Paper Review, so get into the comments, ask us your questions. We'll do our best to answer them for you. Those of you listening later on podcast are just going to have to go on Twitter and deny that it was you, aren't you? Morning, Mike. Um, so what have we got today? Well, the Mirror has splashed on news that the BBC has finally called in police over allegations that one of its top presenters may have broken the law by paying an under 18 for explicit photographs. Now, we're not going to be discussing that today because that's sort of as much as we know. There's almost nothing else to discuss, but also because the laws of defamation and contempt apply here and to you, too. And we don't want any guessing games about who it is. Nothing proven yet, of course. Um, I dare say it will come out in the fullness of time. We'll get our chance. So instead, let's go to page six, where the Mirror's long campaign to get school meals free for everyone has had some success. Ben, this is your story. So presumably what, what you've reported is that the next government of the United Kingdom is going to introduce it, yes? Uh, right, so the Lib Dems are backing it now. Oh. Um, now, I spoke to their education spokeswoman, uh, Manira Wilson, last week, and she came out and told us that the party uh, will make it policy that uh, pro there should be free school meals for all primary school pupils in England. Um, obviously, various Labour politicians have said they will do this already, um, Greater Manchester Metro Mayor Andy Byrne has backed the campaign. Sadiq Khan, the London Mayor, is doing it in London. And his policy in Wales, where obviously Labour's um, in, in office there with Mark Drake as his first minister. But the main Labour Party, the UK Labour Party, led by Keir Starmer, is not backing it in England. Um, they say there isn't enough money and it simply isn't a priority. Now, the reason that this is particularly interesting with the Lib Dems, of course, is that if there's a home parliament at the next election, the Lib Dems would have a key role to play. They could hold the, hold the key to power for Labour. And then what happens is there probably wouldn't be a coalition, but there'd be negotiations around a confidence and supply agreement. And the Lib Dems could say this is one policy they want enacted as part of any deal. So it's a key moment, I think, um, in the campaign. It could make a difference then, perhaps. What do you think, everybody? Do you think that Lib Dems are going to be the kingmakers in the next government? Do you think that um, Labour should be doing this? Do you think Labour's right and that there isn't enough money to go around? I mean, the thing is, Ben, the Lib Dems promising to do something when they're nowhere near power. And then later, perhaps if their support's crucial for a minority government, you know, they do have a history of doing the exact opposite, don't they? <laughs> Not necessarily sticking to everything they said they were going to do. What a surprise for a wishy-washy lived in. But does that make any difference if they're supporting this? Is it going to perhaps force Labour to um, rethink it or or not? Well, it's putting a lot of pressure on Labour. And you know, when you speak to um, senior Labour figures, uh, some of them are actually quite unhappy about the stance that Keir Starr has taken. Um, Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, was on the TV broadcast round yesterday on the Sunday morning political shows. And she was talking about what a state... Um, the economy will be in if, if Labour comes into government, what they will inherit and the fact there won't be much money to go around. Um, and when it comes to it, this isn't a priority for Labour. That is making quite a few senior people around the, uh, well, certainly the Shadow Cabinet, um, making them quite unhappy and they think it should be something that's done, certainly as a point of principle. And in terms of the Lib Dems, I mean, it's to a certain extent it's an easy free hit for them because they're only the fourth biggest party obviously not going to form government. You know, they haven't got to find the money, have they? They haven't got to find the money and they're not going to be a, a, a sole party of government. No one thinks that. But if polls narrow ahead of general election expected next year, um, they could have a major part to play in 
uh, shaping the policies of whichever party is the main party of government. And this could be quite a totemic policy issue. And when they were in the coalition with the Conservatives from 2010 to 2015, yeah, they got a lot of stick, obviously, for um, the tuition fees thing, which they said they weren't going to allow a rise in tuition fees. And then it went up massively. Um, and the, as part of compromise, some people would say, certainly the Dems would say, they ditched that policy in order to get others through. Uh, they point to uh, lifting the personal allowance for tax, so the amount you can earn before it's subject to income tax. That was a lived down policy for which the Conservatives continue to claim credit. And there was also around school meals. Um, the Lib Dems made it a policy for the coalition that infant children should have a hot meal at lunchtime. That was a, a Lib Dem policy. Mm. So when they can point to what they've done in power, um, you know, it's, it is relevant that should there be uh, a minority administration, a home parliament, the Lib Dems could have a big influence on that. They could well change things, couldn't they? We'll have to perhaps see how it's going to pan out. I mean, I don't understand quite why Labour aren't doing it. It's such a clear vote winner. Riz Wallace says Keir Starmer needs to be replaced for Labour to be successful. I don't think the polls are supporting you there, Riz Wallace. I think the polls are pretty much saying that he's doing just fine. Um, now, the Tories can say that this kind of policy is expensive as much as they like, but also the whole country knows that the Tories have been the most expensive in everything so far, thanks to Liz Truss and a few other problems. Um, and all right, Rachel Reeves is sort of a treasury orthodoxy kind of follower. She doesn't want to do anything that she's, she's pretty straight down the line. She doesn't want to commit money she hasn't got. But um, they did come out at the weekend and say that um, they're going to follow the tax and spend commitments of the Tories for the first few years until the until the um, sort of economic problems are over. Is that a, a is that really because they want to do it, or is that a bit of a political gimmick? Because then there's no way the Tories can criticise their taxation plans, is there? If they're exactly the same as the Tories. Yeah, when Rachel Reeves was on the shows uh, yesterday, she was asked about this report that was actually in the Sunday Times, and it wasn't attributed um, on record to uh, anyone from Labour. Well, I think's happened is conversations have taken place where. This is what Labour did in 1997 in the campaign, in the run-up to the general election, which obviously Labour won with a 179-seat landslide. Labour said that for the first two years, they would stick to Conservative um, economic policies. Now, to a certain extent, that was quite easy to do because the economy was doing well when Labour took over. They actually, the Conservatives bequeathed Labour a very healthy economy in 1997. So it's quite easy for Tony Blair, and he did it as you know an electoral um, push, really, to try and not frighten the horses, the, those wavering voters who usually decide elections. If they were worried about what Labour would do to the economy, specifically spend loads of money, put up taxes, well, by saying you're going to follow the Conservative plans for two years, all right, you're going to alienate quite a lot of traditional Labour supporters and some of your own MPs, but the wavering supporters, the floating voters, they're the ones you need to win over in order to get a big majority. So that was seen as sort of assuaging any fears that they might have. Labour has obviously looked at that this time and thought maybe they'll go down that route. Rachel Reeves didn't actually confirm that yesterday and she pointed to some differences with what Labour wants to do, um, particularly around spending on uh, the environment and some policies to tax on energy insulation and energy security. Um, so it's not, it's not clear that they would stick to Tory policies for two years. She tried to make points of difference, but it's also quite clear that Labour won't have any massive radical tax and spend agenda for at least the first few years of the Parliament should they come into office. Mm. And then just hope that they'll be able to spend a bit later on. We'll see how that works out. We'll also see how the Lib Dems actually manage to, um, what they can influence. How many Lib Dems are there at the moment, Ben, in Parliament? Uh, Fourteen. I thought you said four for a minute. I couldn't even name four if I had to. Fourteen. Crikey. At least you found one. Well done. And got them to speak to you. <laughs> we'll have to see how it goes, won't we? Uh, in terms of what, what kind of a kingmaker they, they become in the in the next year or so. But um, right, we need to move on to the biggest story of the day now. And Joe Biden is flying in today for his fifth visit, a fifth meeting with Rishi Sunak in as many months, his sixth meeting overall. He's actually here to visit the king for a climate summit at Windsor, but he's going to pop to Downing Street first after the plane lands. Ben, is he going to just go there for a nice lie down and a snooze? Uh, <laughs> or is there actual work on the table? Um, it's basically a photo op. So Air Force One landed at Stansted last night. 
Um, oh, so it's like, already then. Well, yeah, it's an eight-hour flight, isn't it, from the East Coast? Um, I think he spent the night at Winfield House, which is the US ambassador's residence in, in Regent Park. And he's going to rock up at Downing Street around about half past 10, I think, for, um, for a meeting with Rishi Sunak. They might only meet for about three quarters of an hour. Um, there's no press conference. And we understand that's because the White House doesn't want Joe Biden to field questions from the press. Because if you've ever watched a Joe Biden press conference, they don't tend to go awfully well. Um, <laughs> So he's uh, he's going to be at number ten for yeah about three quarters of an hour. What you can expect is in I believe it's called the uh, the white room at um, at number ten. Uh, it's where they sit next to the fireplace. Uh, it's some lovely, very comfy regal armchairs, and the cameras will be allowed in for the words at the top. But that's usually quite boring. Where Rishi says, "Oh, it's wonderful to have you back, Mr. President." Um, looking forward to our negotiations and Joe Biden will say, oh, it's great to be here again. And then if he's lucky, you'll manage to call him his actual name this time by Rishi Sunak <laughs> rather than the mangled version when uh, Rishi Sunak became prime minister. Yeah. Um, and then it's off to Windsor Castle around about lunchtime where he's going to meet King Charles. There's going to be uh, an inspection of some troops. The anthems will be played in the quadrangle at the castle. Um, and then the two the, the two heads of state, the president and the king, they're going to be briefed by John Kerry, who's climate envoy uh, for the Americans, and Grant Shapps, the energy security secretary, Oof. about some climate change um, measures that are going to take place. Um, realistically, Biden's only popping in here en route to Lithuania, where I'll be going tomorrow for the NATO summit. Um, and then after that, on Thursday, Biden's off to Helsinki, for a meeting of the US Nordic Council. So, you know, it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour around uh, wonderful places of Europe for- um, Yes, for exactly. Health. So presumably at those, those words at the top, as you mentioned, when they have their photo call in Downing Street, Joe Biden will just say, yeah, thank you very much. And he won't say, it's nice to be here, Mr. Pick and Mix in Lithuania, where the hell am I today? And he won't even know what day of the week it is. Mike says, during the Privileges Committee vote that's due in the House of Commons mm. this afternoon, I think this one's on Chris Pincher. Um, there's so many, it's hard to keep track. Will Rishi Sunak keep Joe Biden lo locked in a room with him for the duration? Or will there be an urgent helicopter trip somewhere? Mm. Ben, is Rishi Sunak actually going to turn up to this vote against the, or about the censure of a, of a Conservative MP, which leads, of course, to a by-election? I think actually this one this afternoon, it's um, it's about Boris Johnson's cheerleaders um, trying oh, to influence yes. the Privileges Committee. Um, so this is Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, I think it's Nadine Dorries, and oh. up to eight, I think, Conservative MPs. They wrote to, um, wrote to the Privileges Committee and basically tried to influence uh, their judgment on Boris Johnson. Uh, which obviously was very scathing, um, and it's led to what would have been a 90-day suspension for the former Prime Minister if he hadn't already ducked it and quit Parliament. Um, so there's going to be this debate this afternoon. Um, I suspect Rishi Sunak won't turn up for it. Uh, there could be a vote on it. It's not a done thing that there is necessarily a vote, because if uh, and it's a, if there was, it would be a free vote, so mm. not whipped. But if enough MPs uh, agree anyway, it doesn't have to go to a division. Um, I wouldn't expect to see Rishi Sunak take part in that vote this afternoon. I don't think he'll take part in any debate this afternoon. It's going to be opened by the uh, the Commons leader, Penny Morden. Um, so instead, today, from number 10's perspective, is all about Joe Biden's visit, even though he's only going to be there for three quarters of an hour. Um, the, the other thing that could come up in the Biden talks is, of course, his row about munitions, the cluster munitions that the Americans are sending to Ukraine. Um, now, these are bombs that spread out when they go off and they, they Britain is one of 123 signatories to a convention that bans their use the Americans haven't signed it and the Americans have got stockpiles of them and think well Ukraine needs weapons let's give them to Ukraine so that's a bit of a sticking point between the UK and the US that might get discussed today um, and also at the NATO summit there's you know NATO it's meant to be a consensus organization they don't have votes on who they want to be the next Secretary General. They tend not to have votes on um, additional members uh, acceding to, to the alliance. Um, it is done by consensus. But they did manage to reach a consensus on a new Secretary General. So instead, the current Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, has had his term extended for another year. That comes after it was extended last year. Um, and also, there's a big row at the moment about 
the accession of Sweden, which Turkey is blocking because they don't think Sweden's done enough to clamp down on PKK terrorists um, who basically anchor a huge in Stockholm of harboring terrorists. Uh, so it's, it's all set to be a big row. And now you've got this other row of uh, cluster bombs as well. Um, so what was meant to be a big summit all united behind Ukraine, there's plenty of flashpoints there. Exactly. So um, what do you think, everybody? Do you think that um, Joe Biden coming over is a sort of a publicity coup for um, Andy says, Joe Biden says, Joe Biden at number 10, what time's bingo on? Andy, that's ageist. Um, is it a publicity coup for Rishi Sunak to be meeting him or is it actually going to backfire a little bit? They've got to talk about cluster munitions, which, you know, Rishi Sunak's people have been briefing out that they've discussed. Those are bombs that you drop one bomb and they break into loads of little bombnets. They're indiscriminate. You cannot target them. Um, and they, they go off for years afterwards because they get lost all the little bits. And then, you know, when the civilians move back in again, some kid gets blown up. That's why they are banned in so many countries. But obviously America doesn't want to send Ukraine the bombs that it might need. It wants to send, get, you know, they've got a stockpile of things they can't use easily and they want to have someone else use them, if you like. Um, and then you've got the environment. Of course, Rishi Sunak's just lost his environment minister in Zach Goldsmith. They've just dumped an £11 billion climate plan. And here we are, Joe Biden, who's quite big on the environment, who's just uh, had a big green bit of legislation to invest in jobs and green energy and so on. Very successful. Go through in the US. He's there to talk, meet the king, who is a renowned tree hugger. So that bit of the conversation might not go too well. Then there's the fact that at the bottom of the, of the page there, Ben, you report that we don't have enough troops. Um, we haven't got a plan for the, how our troops are going to be looking in the next few years. There's Ukraine and its accession to NATO. There's a whole host of things they've got to talk about. And they don't necessarily agree on a single single point the whole special relationship is a bit going opposite ways are these talks actually going to be useful ben in terms of changing any of that because you've only got 45 minutes as you said or is it more like a courtesy call in which neither side's just going to move an inch you know is is sunak just going to come out and say well he's fine with the use of cluster munitions for example no it's, it's, sunak's not going to back the Americans over cluster bombs. He's made that quite clear. Um, are the talks going to be substantive in any way? No. Um, <laughs> nothing is really going to change out of it. We know the Americans are unhappy about the defence cuts that the government under the 2021 Defence Command Paper is implementing. That's cutting the size of the army by 9,500 troops from 82,000 to 72,500. We're getting rid of a third of our Challenger 2 tanks. Um, so the Americans are unhappy about that. And then also, there's uh, one of the reports I've done today is about the equipment that the government um, has got and has ordered. So basically, each year um, is a, in effect an, an auditor looks at the really big spending projects that the government has underway and says um, how much the costs have gone up by. In some cases, gone down by, but not very often. And they rate like the colour coded traffic light system um, how likely it is that projects will be delivered on time and on budget. And some of the biggest spending projects, obviously, are to do with defence. Um, and only a handful have got the coveted green rating. Uh, others have got a red rating and others are in the middle. So in terms of what we're planning for the future with our military, the Americans are not massively happy about that. And as the story I've done today shows, there's great doubts over how much of it can actually be delivered. Exactly. And it says there in the New York story, and get this, everybody, all right, the costs have gone up for the defence kit, the projects that are underway, by £9 billion in just a year. I think free school meals is about a quarter of that, if even that. But apparently, we can't afford to feed the children, but we can afford to keep bombing stuff because that's more important. Ben, are these, these costs going up because we're having to re-equip, having given everything that's not nailed down to Ukraine? Or is it inflation hitting things that are already in the pipeline? How have they, how have they managed to spend £9 billion more without noticing? So it's the cost of the projects have gone up. Part of the reason is because of inflation. But... Part of the reason they've gone up due to inflation is because they've been delayed. So if you, you know, if you buy a loaf of bread today, uh, it's a bad example because I don't know how much a loaf of bread is in casket politician for that. But <laughs> say it's one pound twenty, right? Pint of milk. Come on, Ben. You know the in price. My, in my defence, uh, <laughs> you don't just buy a loaf of bread. Do you? you buy it all together. So let's say it's one pound twenty. 
if you delay buying a loaf of bread and it goes up and it's one pound thirty next week, well, mm. it's gone up by ten pence because you didn't buy it on Monday, right? Mm. So that is part of the reason the delays fuel the cost increases, um, and part of you know, the reason is because when something's delayed, particularly with military equipment, new stuff comes out. So if you'd have bought a tank today it's based on what you've got today. But if it's taking five years to build it, well, there's five years worth of new technology. So you can sign off on, yeah, we want it to have this. But then when it's delayed, more stuff comes along. Like, oh, well, we need to put that in there now because that's out of date. Um, when something becomes obsolete and because of the length of time that it takes to, to build stuff, particularly for the military, stuff quite often becomes obsolete. Mm. Oh, and there's one other thing that the Yanks uh, are likely to discuss with number 10 today as well. Um, I was on a briefing uh, with a, a briefing call on uh, Friday night with Washington and their senior policy director for Europe at the National Security Council was saying that they're going to discuss Northern Ireland as well, um, which should go well. Because we know what Joe Biden thinks about Brits in Northern Ireland and what... Uh, what he said a few months ago is that he went on a trip to Northern Ireland to make sure the Brits don't screw around. Um, yeah. which is not very nice of him to say about us, is it? Uh, yeah. so that's come up. Every time he meets the British Prime Minister, he wants to talk about Northern Ireland. Yeah, it does show some awareness, perhaps, of the complete lack of concern that one or two of the previous Prime Ministers have had about Northern Ireland. Riz says that Ireland is the elephant in the room. Uh, that's it. He's got 45 minutes. He's got, they're going to be five minutes on each of these issues, isn't there? They're only going to be talking about something very briefly I should have thought so is Ukraine going to join NATO what's happening with the armed forces plan which is supposed to be producing how can they go they've got this NATO summit uh later this week in Lithuania where Ben's going to be going to get a nice fridge bag on his way home how can they go into that summit without getting these things straight I mean 45 minutes isn't long enough surely they've already bashed it out on email um, so talks have been going on behind the scenes at NATO headquarters in Brussels for months about the, what's called the communique. So the communique emerges at the end of the summit, and this isn't just unique to NATO, this is what happens at all big summits, about what can be agreed. So the leaders only rock up for two days um, and they basically sign it off. There'll be a row about something, obviously, but in the main, stuff has been discussed and sorted out. There is dispute over what they can agree. Um in terms of Ukraine's admission to NATO, so all agree in theory, the 31 members, that Ukraine will one day join NATO. There's a dispute over when it should happen. So Britain wants it to happen as soon as possible. Um, the Americans want it to take longer. There is, we have to be clear about this, that Britain might want it to happen as soon as possible. No one's suggesting it can happen whilst the war is still underway. It can't because then... NATO would be in a war against Russia. We'd then so have to raise, yeah, we'd be trouble. Exactly. And the Article 5 self defense clause, an attack on one's an attack on all. We're not go Ukraine's not going to join NATO whilst Ukraine is at war with Russia. You can't have a country that has armed territorial disputes ongoing joining an alliance which has a collective defense clause. So that's not going to happen. It's a, we want, and Zelensky's going to be at, um, at NATO in Vilnius uh, tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, he's obviously going to say, we want, a pathway to membership, he'll probably be granted that. What he won't be given is a date. No, but one, to tell me, one clear up one thing for me, one thing for everybody else as well, right? Is watching this. We see a lot of Vlad Vladimir Zelensky these days at the NATO summits at G7. You know, he get he gets busked in and he does a little thing, goes and meets the leaders. And Joe Biden goes and has a bilateral with him and goes sits down with him personally and all the rest of it. But joining NATO, you've got to hit certain targets in order to get into NATO, as we've already discussed and Ukraine would be nowhere near any of those targets pretty much if it were not for the, what's happening in the war in Ukraine at the moment because I mean it was a very corrupt country when Zelensky took over he hasn't really had time to fix all that and then the wars happened so you know would would Ukraine have been anywhere near this if it wasn't for the war would Zelensky even get invited to these events if it wasn't for the war Probably not, um, but since, because everyone talks about the, Russia's invasion of Ukraine on February the 24th last year, don't forget, Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014. Yeah. They, went, they took the Crimea and they've taken parts of the, the east of Ukraine in the Donbass. So when that happened, a few countries, including Britain, saw which way the wind was blowing and started training Ukrainian troops 
part of the reason Ukrainians have been so good at defending um, what they and fighting the Russians in the way they have is because for eight years they've been trained up by British troops. Um, and obviously that's intensified, bringing them over to Salisbury Plain, giving them tanks. Um, so that, that sort of coordination um, with Western allies, that's been happening for almost a decade. And mm. one of the things that's likely to come out at NATO, which the Secretary General was talking about last week, actually, is increasing interoperability, which sounds really complicated and boring. But basically it means Ukraine their military systems can start working alongside NATO so that when it does, when the time is right for it to become a member, it's a more seamless transition rather than just using like Kalashnikovs and things like that. They will use NATO standard weapons, NATO grade systems. That's what interoperability is about. And mm. in a practical sense, realistically, is far more important at the moment than whether or not it's actually part of NATO, which is not going to be because it's still at war. Exactly. Now, John says Ukraine is also a warning from NATO. Look what will happen if you take one step in our territory. It's all about the politics. It's all about pushing back against Putin a little bit. And of course, Putin, how long has he got now, having just about survived that failed coup? River says Ukraine was warned not to burn through the ammo. They didn't listen. Cluster munitions have been banned. It's not our problem. Countering war crime with war crime is still a war crime. Uh, you're right, it is. But I do think it is our problem, unfortunately, River, because, you know, Ukraine is next door. <laughs> it's, it's as simple as that. If you let the, you know, the giant hogweed invade the next door's garden, it's going to come into yours, isn't it? And it same with same with wars and and Russia, unfortunately. So something needs to get done. Um, let's hope that forty five minutes that Joe Biden has. Uh, in Downing Street this afternoon uh, is going to be somehow productive. I don't know what you can do in 45 minutes, but uh, there we go. He'll probably spend more time, I expect, with the king talking about the climate before he uh, scootles off to Helsinki. But anyway, at least he's coming. At least he's meeting the king. Didn't go to the coronation, but at least he's there. Um, so we'll have to see how it all pans out later on today. Thank you for those, Ben. Um, now, uh, having talked about war and hunger and everything else, there is some good news in the world. We've managed to find it for you. Here it is. Now, Edwin Starr famously sang, War, huh, what on earth is it good for? Uh, and the answer has finally come. The answer is incubators. So a student called James Roberts a few years ago was watching footage of the conflict in Syria. He was just 22 at the time. He's 31 now. But he saw babies struggling in their early days, having been born prematurely because of the stress their mothers were under, having been in a war. Uh, and of course, that war was being raged by what Russia and its proxies. And his final project as a, an engineering student, he developed a folding incubator that runs on battery power for when the power all goes out now it's been ordered up now for use in ukraine and it's already saved as you can see there in the headline 1500 babies lives an amazing number uh it just goes to show how useful student snowflakes can really be ben is this proof that spending money on children be it healthcare or school meals can have the biggest benefits in the long run well it's good that he's engineered this he's invented it um and the fact that it is deployable in in war zones right i mean that wasn't why he did it um, initially, it was, well, he did look at it in Syria, when also the civil war broke out there in 2011, and he's designed it, and now he's saving lives in Ukraine, um, which is great. Obviously, it's used in other countries as well. Um, do you know you said Edwin Starr, I didn't know Edwin Starr sang war, what is it good for? It was that. Was it? I, I couldn't tell you who it was. I'm interested, mainly because... I'm, I'm worrying now, who did it sang war? <laughs> Cardiff Rugby used to come out to that about 15 years ago. It was their... Um... Edwin Starr. It's Edwin Starr. You made me doubt myself. How dare you? Oh, no, no, I'm, just, I'm surprised. I didn't know. I saw Edwin Starr sing it once. Every day's a school day, eh? Yeah, there you go. Edwin Starr. Whoa. <laughs> that was about Vietnam. Um, but obviously, still has a point. Uh, imagine, though, you know, if James Roberts there had been born in a war zone or hadn't been fed properly as a young man at school, he might not have been able to invent that incubator at all. That's why... You feed children, and it's why you try to stop wars. And don't use cluster bombs, because they're terribly bad, and they kill the children when they come back in again after the war, Mr Biden, if you're watching. Think twice. Um, right, thank you, Ben, for that, taking us through it all. The Defence Supremo, I hope you give your fingers a bit of a rest today. Uh, let the smoke cool uh, before you have to go to Lithuania. 
and have your jolly over there. Thank you, everyone, for taking part. Uh, we will see you again on Wednesday for another edition of the News Agenda. When I expect we're is Wednesday the day of the summit, Ben, or is that tomorrow? Uh, it's Tuesday and Wednesday, two days. Tuesday and Wednesday. All right, so we'll probably be talking the NATO summit again on Wednesday, then, won't we? Unless. Mm -hmm. The BBC's managed to give us some more news between now and then. We'll have to wait and see, won't we? All I can tell you is that it wasn't me. Uh, right. If you're listening on podcast, please leave us a review so other people can find us. Uh, and until then, everybody, we will see you again on Wednesday. Till then, tatty bye. <laughs>